Hi folks, I'm International Master John Watson and this is Ask the Master on ICC TV. The main idea of this show is to provide you, the viewer, with a forum to ask questions about chess and the chess world. And the way we do this is the best way to ask questions is to send me questions by email. I get a lot of these questions. And the email we're using is askimwatson at chessclub.com. That's A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at C-H-E-S-S-C-L-U-B.com, askimwatson at chessclub.com. And uh, you don't have to be a great player or just any sort of questions you have. Um, you can also send me your games via email, and we've looked at a bunch of those, and we'll look at many more as time goes on. You can send me games, questions. We talk about uh, openings a lot. We talk about books. We talk about strategy. We can talk about world chess players and the, world, the situation in world chess, then the top players in the world championship and all those sorts of Anything that sort of comes to mind, don't worry if, you, uh, if you're a strong player or a weak player, it doesn't really matter. We welcome all questions, and I'll see how many of them I can get to. And the alternative is to ask questions live right now on the chat. Um, I, by the way, don't see, I don't see that my streaming channel has shown up yet. So is there a problem here? I don't see the picture. Do you guys see the picture? I'm on the chat over here. Maybe I need to refresh this. Okay, I wonder if something's going on here. Do, are you guys getting a, a picture? I see, Alan, that you're on. First of all, are you hearing me? <laughs> Let's do a little test here. Is anybody hearing me? Colin, Alan? Aha, so something is going funny here. Let me con let me talk to my uh, okay. I think I think we're not we're not connected somehow, or at least I'm not uh, getting the picture. Oh, you do see it. Okay, but you don't see me. Is that correct? Do you do you see the board? I'm not seeing the board on my own internet connection, and that worries me. You do see the board, okay. Then, and I'm seeing the chat, so it doesn't really matter if you see, ah, here it goes. It took some incredible delay. It just popped up, just some huge delay for some reason. All right, so where was I? We'll look at stuff, uh, hi, Alan, hi, Colin, hi, uh, Sean, uh, hi, Ears. Oh, look at all this, this is terrific, thank you. Um, uh, let me, I will wanna f look at a lot of stuff we talked about either last week or the week before or questions I didn't get to, but we could start out by taking a look at the chat. Is there any initial issue that's sort of interesting? Oh, Nigel Davies, who's been around forever. I didn't know he was Welsh. I never knew that. How interesting. So do you live in a town where that's pronounceable? Let me see. Uh, nothing to do with myself, no. <laughs> All right, 1e4, that's it. All right, let's, uh, oh, 1e4 is out on the board, okay. Um, well, that game that was up there already referred to that Smith-Mora question we had. Now, we've got a lot to get to, but let, let's start out with that. Last week, we talked about the Smith-Mora. That's where we left it. And uh, I didn't know what was going on. Some of you were helping me by referring to the Smith-Mora books. We got to this basic uh, defense, which is called the Taylor defense. You can play it in a couple different move orders. This is called the Taylor defense. And for a long time, this is what, when Ken Smith played the Smith Mora in the famous San Antonio International Tournament, you know, 30 years ago or so, he's the only person that ever got into a heavy, incredibly strong international tournament. It had people like um, Karpov, for example, <laughs> and um, uh, Tall, I think, was in it, I, if I remember right. I kind of don't remember exactly who was in it. Larson, I believe, was in it. Anyway, he played it against a lot of these top players. I think he played it against Evans. And they all played, I believe they all played the Taylor defense, and uh, which is this defense. And that put a crimp into the style of the Smith-Mora because they won every game against it. So that, that gave this defense a great reputation. And ever since then, it's still held its reputation as being one of the very best answers to the Smith-Mora. So we were talking about this last week. I didn't remember all the questions. And someone was, some of the original question went, um, um, let me see, how was it? The original question went, oh, if what if white plays? And, and it was like this. It was a refutation. Someone was claiming that this was a refutation, had told one of our viewers that this was a refutation of the Smith-Mora playing this way. 
And just for the record, I looked up some of this stuff, and queen e2, as we suspected when we talked about it, queen e2 is really not a very good move here. You shouldn't let him have that move with tempo. You should do some other move. You can even play h3, although that's kind of a slow move. What I discovered was queen e2 scores absolutely horribly because of bishop g4. You know, there's this threat with tempo. There's this idea. There's an idea of just taking the knight, queen takes back, and then knight e5, and then take the bishop pair, and you're still a pawn down. So it's, it's, a very, it's kind of a depressing position. So white really can't afford to lose that tempo and in fact does have, has played it a lot over the years because queen e2 is the normal setup. The normal, the normal um, Mora setup, let me show you something like, let's just say black played something else, to play like this. And then often play a move like bishop f4 or maybe bishop g5 or maybe even bishop e3. And, um, and you can't do that. And in this case, this is an exception. So a lot of people automatically play that move over the years and they run into this and they've done really poorly. So there are many there are many better moves. As I say, h3 is possible, but it hasn't worked really that well. A move I mentioned last week was, uh, for years, was considered a way to play that, either, the, either on this move or even the last move, playing bishop g5. And it kind of took over as the best try for a little while for white. But still, over the years, it hasn't, hasn't done particularly well. It's done a little better, but black still has a lead both in games and performance rating. And maybe sh I should explain that about performance rating. Um, that's probably a more important figure in many ways, because if, if you have someone who's rated you know, 300 points higher than somebody else, and they win two games and the other guy wins one with a certain opening, let's say some opening score is 2-1, but the average rating of the person who's you know, got the two points is 300 points higher, well, that really means that that opening um, well, it depends which side they're on. But, but if, they're, if they're the ones playing the particular opening, then that opening's really not even doing very well because the expected score is higher than that. It's probably, I don't know, four to one or five to one or something. Anyway, you get the idea. Some, some rating differentials, you expect a 10 to one result. And so even if the side playing, let's say it was the smith Moore, for example. Let's say it was played by very weak players against very strong players. And you might have rating differences where the very strong players as black are supposed to win 10 out of 11 games just by normal e expectations. Well, if it turns out they only win six or five, uh, um, well, I don't know, let's say five to one ratio of, let's say they win, I don't know, seven games and, and lose three. Well, they've won, it looks good, seven wins versus three losses, but in fact, it shows that the smith Moore is a pretty effective opening because the performance rating for the side playing the smith Moore, a white, is gonna be pretty good, it's gonna be pretty high. Um, and so that's kind of the idea of performance rating. Uh, there's going to be th that person's going to have a lead over the over the stronger players. The the, the side with the Smith Moore is going to have a performance rating lead, and um, that would imply that it was a pretty good opening, or in, at least in some respects, maybe for lower players to play against higher players. But the performance rating is actually better for black um, in 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 almost every. Uh, it's way better for black from this position. And it's, it's extremely better after these moves for black. And it's somewhat better after, it's quite a bit better after h3. It's, and, and bishop g5 has done a little bit better for white, but it's still the black's performance rating is higher. And his number of wins is also higher. So, so there's really no good solution here. But what's happened, uh, it looks like there's no good solution. But what's happened over time is that the good players, especially over the last maybe, I don't know, uh, eight to 10 years, have switched to this move, um, bishop f4. That's by far the best move, and it's done pretty decently. It's the only really serious um, move in this position, in my opinion, once you really get down to it. And all the books now are recommending bishop f4. The early books on the Smith Moore didn't, but now they all give bishop f4, including Esterman and Langrock, the guys that are sort of the leaders in, in Smith Moore theory. So, and it wasn't played much for many years, hardly at all. But now it's the most popular move among any good players, anybody who's really studied the, the, the Smith Mora. Um, black still won more games by a fair margin, but when you get to performance rating, since usually black outrates white, when you get to performance rating, black has only a tiny edge. I mean, it's, uh, it's still better than, than black does normally in chess, but not, not a lot better. So I'm convinced this is the best line. Um, so let me just show you this game. Let's see if I've got a copy of some, some notes here. Oh, I want to show you a good, what I think is a decent way for black to play this. Now, the idea, one of the ideas here is that if, if black plays like this, white's going to play here, and then the, try to exploit this big hole here, because he's going to be able to get rid of this bishop. So, and then the other idea is if black plays a natural move, like 
uh, e6, then that pawn's fairly weak and you've already got a piece aiming at it. So then now queen e2 makes a lot of sense, followed by rook d1, because this is a weak pawn. So that bishop f4 move can be very handy. Now on the negative side, um, well, let me just show you what can happen here. Um, and the bishop g4 now, you haven't lost a tempo by playing queen e2. So now if you play h3, that's a little bit better. And it, this, this position has done okay for black. You can either play back, which I think is probably best actually, uh, or you can play, you can capture. Uh, capturing, it's funny, just the, having the two bishops for white and having a little bit extra space has turned out to be okay, pretty pretty reasonable for white. I think he has full compensation for a pawn. The main point is, is that black would love to play here, force the queen to move and take this bishop, and then he would just stand better with an extra center pawn, an extra pawn really for very little compensation. But um, there's this option of taking. And then white's much better because he's way too far ahead in development. The queen is very awkwardly placed here. Doesn't really have much of a place to go to. And you just maybe take my word for it, but white's got too much development here and too much attack. So that's another really good point about bishop f4 is that bishop uh, g4 and bishop takes doesn't allow this fork. So um, so this position, it's not like it's better for white, but he has, he has quite a bit of play. I won't go into too much more detail than that. It's probably about equal. I think if black wants to play this position, he should play bishop h5. And, um, but white still has quite a lot of play here. It's a, pre it's a pretty interesting and reasonable position. So let me show you a little trick. After this has happened in several games, some of the strongest players know this position, and they've played this nice move which is really kind of odd, you know, moving a piece twice, but it does gain a tempo on the bishop and it takes the pressure off of the d6 pawn. So the knight might even eventually go back again, but what you're trying to do is get developed and get safe and get out of these pins and attacks um, before, and, and before you have to retreat, before you have to sort of um, reorganize. So white usually plays there. There's not much of a better square at that point. And um, in this game, black plays there, they usually do. And white plays here, because what else is white going to do for his plan? He wants to get on the, the file. Sure, eventually he'll be attacking that, but right now it would be sort of silly. I mean, that, that, for example, is way too loosening. You actually lose time now because that's attacked. And um, so what happens is that after rook comes over here, attacking in the center, then black uh, unpins with the move bishop d7, because, because white's starting to think in terms of e5 or even g4 and e5, so, so it'd be with tempo. So black unpins, and this is a basic position that's been arrived at a lot of times, and the point is, is that e5, which has been tried many, many times, is just a little bit too ambitious, because now it's two pawns, and the knight can maybe go to f4 sometimes. So the, the idea of e5 is to play here and work on these dark squares, and sometimes it's worked out, but overall, well, you know, for example, there was a game with, against Roy Robson recently by a pretty good player where he tried this move, attacking the knight. And um, it worked out pretty badly because after capturing, he decided that after capturing black's position was just way too solid here, gotten rid of too many pieces. So white's idea was this very clever idea. Now black just won a piece, but white plays this clever little move, hoping that the idea is to course to take on this square and the bishop is pinned. And so he's hoping for takes and check. And now all of a sudden white's got a great game because even though he's still a pawn down, um, this he's got all the dark squares, a lot of pressure, and these pawns are very weak. And this knight can come into this beautiful square. So it was a clever idea, but Robson just played very calmly, played this move, and he was still a piece up. <laughs> so white had to do something, because if white simply takes that, then black simply takes that. And if white takes this, which is, I think, what he did, then this bishop is protected. And so black remained a piece up. You know, against a master player, he, he won the game basically in just, you know, 13 moves or so as black. So white can be a little too ambitious in these positions, do clever things that don't quite work. That's a somewhat better move. I believe it's knight a4 in this position. But, um, and that's happened in a few games, but then just knight here, queen over to d2 and knight comes back to block off the attack because you're two pawns ahead, so you can afford to give one up. And I don't think I'll go into any more detail, but you can kind of imagine that white doesn't have enough attack here. Um, he doesn't have any center pawns left, that's a problem. So it's close, I mean, e5 is an interesting move. So the main move 
instead of that is what was played in this game, which is here. Getting the bishop out of the way of various forks and attacks, like knight a5, getting rid of it. Rook c8 no longer attacks the bishop. Queen c7 doesn't. It's just a good general move. If you ever do get, e if black's castling, you might swing the bishop back here to attack. That's a common theme. So it's, you're basically just sort of getting out of the way and making a useful move. That's been played, this has been played many, many games. Now, I think black should just castle. This is what Mecking did many years ago against Costa. And the idea is that after white plays here, by the way, that was another point of bishop b3. Is that, so white can play knight a4, but not get forked with b5. Uh, black just came back. White played here against knight g4. Black played over here. And pretty soon, black was just a pawn up, basically. There just wasn't enough going on here. Um, now these moves may not have been best, but I think most people feel that this is a this just is a good position. White can, tried to come back to get to b6 again, and something like this happened. I think it was rook over, knight takes, rook takes. Black has white has two bishops here, but black has two center pawns, no weaknesses, a solid position, and his development is just fine. So even though maybe white has a tiny bit of compensation, just because the bishops are strong, it's not enough for a pawn. That's that's kind of the way this sort of theory goes. And in this game, black came back immediately. And that's actually, I don't think, quite as good a move, but it's very interesting. This is a game where Gallagher was black, and he's a great player for in, in all, all these uh, Sicilian positions. But um, so white came back again, attacking this again. And black tried a different plan, which is to play e5. And that's really the question. When Sometimes you can get away with playing e5, even though you lose this square d5, because after all, you're a pawn up, and once you get castled, you're safe. You know, in the Sveshnikov, uh, Sicilian black gives up this square without winning a pawn. <laughs> and here he's at least won a pawn. So this was a nice a nice thing. Now he covers the d5 square, so any piece that gets on there he can take. And um, white took, which I'm not even sure if that's a very good move, because now these pawns really defend some vulnerable squares that white knights could have been going to. Um, and the funny thing is, is that, oh, so, so black got much the better game. Actually, white ended up, kind of coming back in this game and getting a de decent game. But at this point, roughly around here, um, black had a, a clear advantage, really nice advantage. So um, uh, the idea here is that, well, he's, he's going to play. In fact, that actually happened. White took this and black doubled the pawns and had a great game, although, white, as I say, white did manage to come back. You might wonder, well, why can't he just take that? That looks great, right? And then take again. But um, at this point, this is a very strong move because the bishop's hanging. So he was counting on a particular tactic. Anyway, so that just to give you some background on that, and I think I'll just stop there, but that was to kind of catch up on that Smith-Morris stuff. This is the way white should play it, but it's also I thought I'd try and show everybody the way that black should answer. So just to do that one more time, let's, go, let's do the whole thing. It's fun to learn about an opening, especially so there's so many Sicilian players out there. Here's the Smith-Morris gambit. White's a pawn down, trying to get a lot of development, get a lot of pieces out. Here's the Taylor defense, the most sort of almost the most famous defense, but um, not necessarily the only one or the best one, but still a good defense. And here's the move you almost have to make on this eighth move, Bishop F4. There just aren't any other good moves, uh, and that's what I discovered when I went to research this. Someone had mentioned this move last week, by the way, had mentioned that Bishop F4 was the right move. And then a good way for Black to play against this is right here. If he plays slowly, White's been getting a pretty good game, getting plenty of compensation. But this immediate knight h5 move seems to be kind of embarrassing for white, who is, after all, just a pawn down. And then what you do is you really quickly break any pins along the file, and you're ready for moves like b5 and rook c8, and you, and then you and then you castle. And you can always bring the knight back later if you want to recentralize it. Okay, so that's just kind of a beginning thing. Um, let's see what we've got here. Ah whole bunch of comments. Great. Okay, if I started from scratch, what do you recommend for a 1600 USCF player with no, no formal, let me read that for everybody. If, if starting from scratch, what do you recommend for an approximately 600 uh, ELO USCF player with no formal opening training to play against D4? What's a good system to learn and why? Well, let me give you the, the standard answer to that, I would say, is to play double D pawn to get used to classical chess. Just just play that move, get get your share of the center, don't get fancy, and if they do play the queen scam, but when you'll find an awful lot of people playing slowly against you, and we can talk about that. But basically, it's a question of learning how to develop your pieces, 
get castled and then enter the middle game with with confidence and against this um if you're about 1600 you could, you probably want to play one of the more solid systems like either e6 queen's gambit declined learn some lines or maybe the slob defense um, but maybe a very conservative line in the slob defense those are the two solid things to play i think the queen's gambit acceptor which we talked about a bunch over the last few weeks is a good opening and it's interesting but it also means that white has these center pawns and gets a lot of early attacks so i would probably tend to play it more safely if you do play the queen's gambit declined um now of course there's a lot of variants here like whether you want to play bishop e7 first or knight up first or things like that but i would say that in the in the classical lines a really good line to play with a lot of practice just to get a lot of practice uh, now a lot of people recommend the um the lasker defense and I really don't, because I don't think you necessarily want to play a position where a bunch of minor pieces have been taken off. You don't really need to do that, and you have very you have very limited winning chances. It's probably better for your chess in general to go ahead and play something like the Tartikauer, which is also extremely solid. You have to study it a little bit, but I think that would be a good system. Against the exchange variation, you can just play normal lines, and you have to look them up. But against the exchange variation, you can play. You can, you can avoid the exchange variation, maybe, if you want to, by playing this first. In which case, that is not a that's a, a, a less. You are, there's no bishop g5 there, but I guess I would say the queen's gambit declined is a good starting point. So I guess I agree with with people about that. But but you can you can just go right into knight f6 and learn some systems. You probably again want to start out more solidly, like play maybe an e6 system rather than the king's Indian defense, in my opinion. Um, but it also depends on what style and what you want to, if you think your weaknesses are, are tactical or something, you might want to play a real dynamic line like the Benoni defense or the King's Indian defense. If you think your tactics need practice, if you want to get a real possible attacking double-edged games. Um, so that's a superficial answer, but we don't want to spend too long on any particular question here. Uh, Colin, I have a question regarding defensive play. First, besides Petrosian and Karyakin, who would be a good role model study uh, to study for games with instructive defensive play? Um, <laughs> uh, any any grandmaster basically is, is probably not too bad. Um, Karyakin is not was never considered really a defensive player uh, for years because he's very he's, he was traditionally pretty aggressive with white, uh, played very aggressive mainline e4 openings. Um, uh, Carlson, obviously, Carlson can play all parts of the game, but he's a tremendous defensive player um, and, and might be worth looking at for defensive play for, among current players. Let me see. I assume you're talking about contemporary players at this point. So, um, yeah, you know, Petrosian, actually, I don't know if I would use him. Petrosian is inspiring to study for any. He's one of my very favorite players, by the way. He's one of, you know, he might be my favorite player. But it's very – he, he – he takes a lot of chances because he's able to calculate and, and, and feel that he can survive really marginal positions. You probably don't want to play that kind of defense too much, um, at least not till you get really, really good. So I don't think Petrosian necessarily is that good a player to study defense with because his style of defense tended to be very complex and dynamic and it's not uh, it's not very static. <laughs> he, he tended to play things that required a lot of calculation and understanding that you could survive some attack that they're just all the pieces are rolling at you and um, so probably he also tended to give up space and, and you may not want to want to do that. Um, modern players they're also good at defense, but who would be a good example? One one thing that distinguishes the modern top players in the world is they're all able to take somewhat worse positions and basically get draws out of them or at least get get enough play that they have the draw in hand and um so that's a that's a i'm, I'm just trying to think you could take almost any current uh grandmaster aronian is amazingly resourceful in defense um yeah that's a, it's a tough question uh and I'm, i mean i'm not sure if any particular player is that much better than, than other ones if in that regard uh, any practical tips for defending bad positions over long games? I, I think the most practical tip that I that I don't follow enough, maybe nobody does, is make up your mind quickly. You're probably going to have to spend more time thinking than your opponent uh, if you've got a defensive position. It's just easier usually to attack than defend, and you get scared. Uh, you, there's so many. Th if you're really defending and there are a lot of threats and potential threats, you're going to want to cover them all, and, and at some point you have to use your instincts some. Uh, don't get in time trouble is probably the biggest one because what happens and I see you see it constantly uh, I just saw a couple of games just like this 
where a person defend, you know, defended perfectly against a, a really a strong player, and you know, got to an even game and was just didn't have enough time and blundered. Um, that's a very common pattern. Sometimes you just have to have faith in moves. You can't work everything out. You have to try to work things out as much as you can, but keep moving quickly because there's probably going to be more threats on the next move and the next. If you're playing a talented player, a good player, and you've already got the worst game and you're defending, then you probably aren't going to get out of everything in one move. They're going to keep the pressure on. So you can't just solve one position. You have to solve, you know, 10 positions or at least play well against 10 different, you know, moves. So that's not much of a practical tip, but I think it's the thing people do worse in defense. It's the thing I do worse in defense. Um, how do FIDE ratings compare with the USCF? There's usually about a 10, 100, well, traditionally it's been called about a 100 point difference. So at least once you're over maybe 2200, I don't know if that's true, or maybe over 2000, I don't know if it's true on the, you know, 1600 and 1200 level, but basically USCF ratings are higher and they're higher by about 100 points. I think you can subtract 100 points and get a good estimate. At least that's been my understanding over the years. Ulf Anderson is a defensive player you'd like to study. Yeah, possibly. Um, it depends what kind of defense you're doing poorly. If it's a question of you don't play well without much space in positions and you have no, but you have no weaknesses, you know, that's the kind of thing Ulf Anderson did well. Um, and uh, not necessarily, he, if he was getting attacked, he really, he was very good at not allowing people to attack him in the first place. If you look at Ulf Anderson games, he played openings brilliantly that he'd studied very, very seriously that may have been passive, but they didn't allow the opponent to attack him. So, so his defensive play was defensive more in, in a, only in the sense that he wouldn't have much space. Um, and... Um, so I don't know. I mean, you can't go wrong studying Ulf Anderson's games, that's for sure. I mean, you know, a great player, and but it's a very particular style, and, and it depends on the openings very much. It depends on the openings he plays. Um, yeah, he's solid, but solid is not the same thing necessarily as being – I think maybe the question earlier was what about, what about playing defensively when you have a poor position or when the other side has an attacking position or, or you, you have to make sort of – you're always uh, you're always trying to meet threats. You're trying to answer threats. That's um, what I assume. That's partly what the question was. Um, do you remember what Larson had to say about the gambit, about the Mora? Oh, it was probably something devastating. Larson was very sarcastic. Why don't you tell us, John? Because I don't don't remember, but I'm sure it was funny. Uh, something about give me an extra pawn, I imagine. <laughs> But yeah, go ahead, John. Tell us the uh, tell us the punchline to that one. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, yes, there is a book of Anderson's games. I, I heard it written by I think Scandinavians too, and I think it's uh, probably excellent. And yeah, he's he's definitely a, a great player. I'm just not sure if that's. It's not just defense for Anderson. It's positional chess generally, and playing with less space. I think a lot of times he's pretty good at studying his games. I don't think he was particularly good at being in a wildly tactical position and defending brilliantly. You know, I don't think, uh, he just didn't, he didn't allow that to happen. It was, was the key with, with Anderson. Uh, he would, he'd get the game to an end game very often. He's very good at trying to transition to an end game from the opening. He gets two end games amazingly often. Ones that are maybe slightly worse, but he's a great end game player. He was a tremendous end game player. And also maybe they weren't bad enough that he would lose. He would, he would just get slightly the worse of it and hang on and draw. He had a lot of draws. Rolf Anderson played a lot of draws, but against the very top players of the world, he could also draw a lot of games. So that made a that that's not bad, is it? Okay, seeing the queen's gambit line and more and more. What about an a6? What unique lines could come from this? Yeah, let's let me wait a little on that um, because there's so many a6 lines, so it's a little bit general. We might do that, might end up doing that next week, or you can send me an email with us some of the specific lines. What he's saying is that there's an awful lot of queen's gambits. Where, and Slavs, actually, also, where a6 is played early. Um, Queen's Gambit Acceptance, there's a lot of early a6s. So, um, uh, so the question is, so, so his question has to do, you know, a lot of times it takes an a6. So his question is, uh, how do you, how, you just can't give a general answer about uh, what unique lines can these come from? Well, first of all, the Slav lines are pretty obvious. They're variants of the Chir Cherbenenko. You can play a6 already here. Normally it's more like here and either after either e3 or knight f3, a6 is played and that's played really, really a lot. And there's books on it and DVDs on it. So that's a popular a6. 
The, it's also been played in the Queen's Gambit accepted a lot more often real early on, like for example right now, before anything else. There's also A6s in the traditional Queen's Gambit declined. And let me think about which ones I'm, I have to, I have to think for a second about where A6 has been played a lot recently. Um, maybe in the, no, hang on. Where is A6 being played recently? There's some sort of main line where A6 is coming up a lot. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's even this early, but very early you're seeing a lot of A6s, but I, I'm afraid I can't, I can't pull that off the top of my head right away. Um, yeah, it's a recent book, isn't it? I, was, I guess I was wrong, too, because Jürgen Kaufeld, that doesn't sound like a Scandinavian. I thought they were Scandinavians. It sounds more German. It might be a quality chess book, even. But uh, I'll bet it's a great... I mean, I suspect it's a very good book. Um, someone, someone reviewed it and seemed to think it was really good. Uh, no, I haven't reviewed it. Nigel, J. Nigel J. Davies discovered he is Welsh like Obama discovered he was American. Hmm. <laughs> we will, we'll pass on that one. I have no idea. Um, is it good to be, is it good to be Welsh? <laughs> is, is it a positive thing? Well, not sure. Uh, okay, let me see. Oh, wow. Skipped a whole bunch here. Uh, just joking, I love Obama. Obama. Death to Obama. <laughs> I haven't lived in Wales myself since 1981. Chagorin. Yes, you could play the Chagorin. I used to teach my students the Chagorin, uh, but they were already pretty good. They were already pretty good players. The Chagorin is a little underrated, I think. It's a, it's sort of like some of the Benoni lines. It's sort of like there's so many good lines against the Benoni, but then when you actually break them down, it turns out that, that none of the they're all okay for black too, sort of. I mean, there's a lot of that with the Chagorins where you have to you have to defend so many potential refutations, uh, and, they, and and so many of them have good reputations for white. But then, if you play correctly, you can get away with it. It's a fun line that you're going. You can you can probably not something you're going to keep your whole life as your main weapon, but um, good, uh, interesting practical weapon. Uh, semi Slav is solid. Yeah, you can play the Semi Slav. I wouldn't recommend that to a 1600 player. I really wouldn't because it's way you're losing space. You're conceding space. So you're you're gonna well for one thing there's this or you got to find you got to find the right order because here you have the you have to deal with e4, but um, there's too many dy dynamic lines. I mean if you play this way of course you have to worry about bishop g5 stuff. Even if you play solidly, even if white plays solidly with e3 and maybe queen c2 and things, you'll find that you're getting attacked a lot, and you have to learn a lot of theory because you have to, you really pretty much have to play the Moran variation at some point. Um, there's not many good options to this, even though sometimes people play bishop d6. Um, and that, and that means you're playing without development and you're giving white a big center. So you're playing a counterattacking line. And that's really tough for a 1600 player. You can lose a lot of miniatures as black, a lot of miniatures. So I would not recommend the semi-slav for black for a, for a lower player. Just, just wouldn't. It's a very sophisticated opening uh, and risky. It's a very risky opening. Okay, is d6 better than e6 in the Smith Mora? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, it just depends which. Um, yeah, again, kind of a general question. We can look at it real fast. Oh, I should get to some of the questions I got from last week. But but real quick, we were just talking about this. Um, it depends which system you're setting up. What he's asking is, should, could, should you play, let's say you play this first, I guess. Most people play this first. Although I showed you earlier, I showed you guys uh, this defense that... Um, I've been looking at for 20 or 30 years now that I think is actually sound for black. That's an e6 defense. His point is e6 cuts off the bishop, so it's good defensively. On the other hand, it already weakens the square. Uh, most Mora defenses, I would say, most of the famous Mora defenses, you play both e6 and d6, because after all, you've got to get your pieces out, and you have to stop e5 at some point. So most, most of them, you'll see they play both. So it's a question of order. The Taylor defense that we were just looking at, black is, uh, white is, uh, black is playing uh, e d6 first and waiting with um, e6 because he wants to keep this bishop out. But eventually he'll probably play e6 or e5. That's the other thing. It's, it's kind of a flexible setup. But, um, but usually you're going to play both of them. So I don't think there's a general principle. Um, if you played e6 early, the reason you would play it was because you, you wanted to get your pieces out usually. For example... Um, What's a line where black doesn't play? Well, you can play this, for example. I played this when I was younger. John might remember that. I used to play, and Larson played this too, speaking of Larson. Um, did we get a punch line on the Larson? 
I didn't see the punchline on the Larson, but anyway, um, you can set up with things like this and bishop d6 and or knight e7, depending which what you're in the mood for, these kinds of moves. I used to play that way. So there I wasn't playing uh, d6. But most of these lines, if you play e6, you're going to play d6 later. So, so often the move order doesn't even matter. Um, I have trouble with long moves. And while I can solve complicated combinations, I always miss simple one movers. How can I fix these problems? You know, this is the sort of thing that if you send me an email with, a, with an example or two, that would really help. So I'd kind of know, um, you know, a little, a little more about what to say. How can I fix these problems? Most problems are you solve by playing a lot and experience. But let me think. Long moves where I, where I can solve... While I can solve complicated combinations, I always miss simple one movers. Oh, well, that you can you can help fix by doing a blunder check every move. And my version of a blunder check is basically, um, first of all, after they make their move, the first thing you do is you look for your one movers. You look you look at all your checks and your captures and your forcing moves. That's what I always tell my students to do. Look at look at all your checks, even if they're silly, and see if there's a fairly simple answer. And and make sure you look at all those. Okay, let's say you don't have anything. You think and think and think. You decide on your move. And right before you make your move, whatever you've decided upon, ask if he has any checks, captures, or forcing moves, and make sure you have good answers for them. That's the best the best way to fix one mover issues. Just do a little routine. And you get faster and faster at it. It doesn't take much time after a while to, 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 to do what's essentially a blunder check. It's a little more complicated than a blunder check because it covers more, more areas. But it's also a good exercise because it gives you more ideas about the position. It makes you think about moves more. It makes you think about, you know, what, what happens if he plays this capture? Well, maybe it's a silly move, but at least I get to kind of think about the implications or this forcing move. Um, okay, I disagree. Solving lots of mate in one or two combinations, simple mates in one. Yeah, I don't think so. I, yeah, I, I think I, I, I don't think that helps you avoid blunders. I don't, I don't think that it's, – it's good to solve one and two move combinations, no question, but I think you won't, it won't help you see – just because there's mates in one doesn't mean you're not going to fall into them. Basically, you've got to slow down right before you make your move and make sure there isn't a, a, a strong move against you. Um, I don't think you have to study them. I think you'll see the moves. Once you, as long as you bother to look, you'll see a mate in one. Uh, before you make your move, if there's going to be a mate in one uh, coming – Really, all you have to do is slow down and look and say, are there any checks? Checks. If you ask for any checks, one of them would be a mate in that case, and you would see it, and you'd go, oh, I don't want to play that way. So I think a blunder check would cover it without really having to study independently. Uh, I play completely unorthodox openings. I don't know how to learn openings properly. I'm an 1813 rated player. That's pretty good. Um, now I want to take my rating to 2200. Please tell me how to learn openings properly. I play 1e4 from white and 1e5 against e4. King's Indian defense against d4. How to learn them properly? Well, um, I, I mean, since you already know what openings you're playing, it looks like, or that you've chosen, um, I don't know if you have any books or DVDs that you study. I would take a uh, um, look at grandmasters who play the same variations as you do. You can, again, send me an email and get more specific, and I can make recommendations for what to study in particular lines. This is too general, the way it stands, but... Um, I mean, if you play e5 against 1e4, then you can um, you study the, one of the many, many repertoire books that have just come out over the last couple of years on 1e4, e5. There's so many of them. There's plenty of good King's Indian Defense books. Why don't you send me an email? That's imwatson at chessclub.com. Um, I'm sorry. Um, what did I say? <laughs> um, Ask I am Watson at chessclub.com, excuse me, and uh, you can go to the beginning of the show to listen to that and get that uh, email address. Uh, let's just keep moving here. I think I'll stop for a second. Hey, John, did you give your answer to the Larson uh, thing? His annotation. Okay, this is uh, Larson's answer about the Smith Mora. Playing anything other than c5 against Smith was a blunder. Oh, that's good. In other words, Ken Smith was the one who was playing the Smith Mora gambit. And what Larson said is that if if Smith plays e4, you're you're an idiot not to play c5 because uh, if you play c5, you're guaranteed he'll play this horrible this horrible gambit, uh, and you'll win the game. Whereas if you play anything else, you're you know you're not taking advantage of that fact. So that's that's funny. Okay, okay. So let me slow down for a second. And do some of the various things we we're going to do. Uh, I can't believe I did that. Spent that long. 
Um, oh, from an earlier show, here's something I can answer instantly without doing any analysis. Uh, someone had asked, we were doing the O'Kelly variation, and in response to the O'Kelly variation, and we looked at a lot at C3, we looked at some other things too, but we mainly looked at C3, um, he asked what about this move, and asked if this was a legitimate response, and it's a very simple answer, which is yes, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a good move, um, because um, what you're doing there, let me just show you, this closed Sicilian now, you'll see many, many players not playing this move anymore, they play this move first, and uh, after this move they play b5, to get an interesting game, so, so that's, if they can do that, you can obviously play b5, in the same position. It gets the exact same position. That doesn't mean it's necessarily the best move objectively, but it's definitely playable. And then and then it's interesting because white can go back into a normal position, a normal Sicilian, so you presumably you have to like these kinds of positions. But um, one thing you, I think you can try, actually, is this move. People have been making that move a little bit, just to have some fun with uh, without, without going directly into an open Sicilian. So yes, you can play b5, and of course you're not, you're not limited to b5, um, what are we doing here? We're talking about the uh, oh, we're talking about the O'Kelly order. You're not limited to b5, but it's definitely a playable move. Uh, you can also just start trying to transpose into other. You can play e6, for example, and then you'll have a con variation if he plays like that. Uh, you can play knight. You can always play knight c6, of course. Um, but you know, knight c3 is a legitimate move. But in fact, a lot of O'Kelly type players will play that move because they want to stay in unique lines that are not main lines, open Sicilians. Okay, um, that was a question. I have, um, oh, the question about B6, uh, about the Petrosian system in the French that I started answering, we talked about a little bit in the winnower, playing B6, the B6 and Queen D7 positions um, in this here. Now you've got the two moves. You go back to last week to look at this. Uh, there are these two moves to get to this kind of a funny position where, for example, you end up, just, just to show you, you end up in a position like, um, and now the bishop goes back. No, he doesn't have to go back. I'll talk about that. Uh, but the idea is you end up in this funny position that Petrosian and Bronstein used to play. I'll just make moves, uh, which was with the knight on c6 in front of the c-pawn instead of attacking that way, and then castling queenside, maybe playing f6. And I wanted to say a few things about that. We talked about that. One thing is the queen d7. I looked up some stuff. The queen d7 move order. By the way, Petrosian, I was surprised. Bronstein, play, Bronstein and Petrosian both played this extensively. They played this maybe even just in mega base, almost 20 times each. And and some of them were later. It wasn't like they just played in them in some faddish period. They played them later in their careers too. So I was very impressed that they sort of thought they were playable. I think most. I think they mainly played b6, but but sometimes they played bishop, queen d7. They mostly played b6 here. Queen d7 has one disadvantage. I think after queen d7, you might want to go into this line, which is another option. You might want to play b6 this way and then play bishop a6. Because if you play bishop f8, even though white didn't play this move that much, he scored overwhelmingly when he played, I'm sorry, uh, here, here, and now here. This move just gave black fits because he can't play the bishop a6 move that he wanted to. And if he starts trying to do the plan with, with uh, playing um, bishop b7, knight c6, he gets attacked really quickly on the, on the queen side. b4 seems to give uh, black fits. So that was interesting to find out. And obviously c5 is still a problem because the bishop b5 is going to pin with tempo. So I don't remember exactly how that went, but it wasn't working out very well. I think you take once first here and then play here. And, it's just very awkward position, and there's no bishop a6 anymore either. You'll notice. And um, anyway, what I, I discovered that, and I didn't really realize that that was that good. So I think if I was going to play this order with the idea of playing bishop f8, I would play b6 first. And this one's not so bad. You haven't lost as much time. And now, now I think uh, this is a lot easier. This kind of position isn't, isn't bad at all. There's no bishop b5 forcing you to play knight c6, for example. Um, not that white can't play this way. It's a reasonable way for white to play, but it's not that dangerous. Just a little point of fact. And what was the thing I was going to show you? Oh, one of the better ways for white to play against this. We talked about how, what black's doing. Um, so I have this game. Let me look at this uh, game. A real old game, actually. This is the way that top players ended up playing against the system a lot. 
with quite a lot of success. Now, black's still playing this line, but I think white is one that has a really nice record with this particular system. And very strong players of black do allow it. So it's still played for black, so you shouldn't despair. But it's this line. Let me show you. You just get a piece out. It's playing with, um, with the line bishop e5, c6, and now coming back again. A lot of you may have seen this, but I noticed, I remember Nick DeFermian playing this. And it turns out there are many, many games with this. It's a clever thing. What White wants to do is play knight back and strengthen his center with c3 and put the bishop back on c2 where it sort of belongs anyway but all along avoiding the exchange of his light square bishops, which is the point of the system. In other words, if white had played this move, black would have played here now, most, most of the time, getting rid of that. And now sometimes they play, as I say, bishop b7 and knight c6, but bishop a6 is one of the main points here. So white avoids that idea by playing bishop here and bishop back. It looks artificial, but it's done very well. Now there are countless games with this. It's really interesting because white sort of figured out this was a good system, but of course black had to figure out how to play against it. And this is the main idea black has, not always immediately, but he challenges the bishop so that he can unpin this pawn. So you get this, and you also it, may, it means that white can't go bishop c2 in one move. He has to take two moves to do it because he doesn't want to exchange. Oh, by the way, I should just say the obvious here. He doesn't want to exchange off this bishop for that one because that's his good bishop and that's bad, black, black's bad bishop. He doesn't want to be left with the bishop that's on the same color as his center pawns. You always look at the center pawns when thinking about your good and bad bishops. Okay, so, so in this game, white strengthens his pawn chain, but black does get back to his, his standard attack and he's managed to take his bad bishop and make it pretty active. If nothing else, it can exchange for a knight and that might not be such a bad deal for your bad bishop. Anyway, this is sort of a standard position that happened, and Black did not play this one very well because this is kind of an older game. Um, Black, in my opinion, Black should play a5, which looks very strange, but the idea is that later on White's best plan is really to play a4, a5 against this pawn, even as a pawn sacrifice, and now he can't do that. So the bishop has a nice place to tuck back into. I think that's the best way to play it. And um, so here's how this game went. Um, and white played. And here's a good example of where white could play already uh, very strong. A4, A4 is very strong. And if the bishop comes back, which is what it usually does, this is, this is quite a good move. Because if the knight takes, you have captures. And now the pawn can't take back because the rook takes, and the bishop can't take back because of this fork. So, um, so A4, A5 is quite a, quite a good theme. Probably black would take. But then you still have to deal with these a5 ideas and b4 ideas, and white's actually considerably better here. So black has figured out better methods than knight e2, g6. But this, this game was played in early stage, and instead white just decided to kind of keep attacking. It actually tried attacking on the king's side. And he still has the better game, white does, because he has more space. But black's got quite a few counter chances, and in fact managed to pretty much equalize here. I'll just show you some moves. Now, black maybe should have taken advantage of the chance to try and challenge that bishop and take over this square at some point, and he didn't. He never did that. On the other hand, he got a good game. Maybe, maybe, maybe white shouldn't have taken that. And I don't know. Maybe I'll just say this game was fairly even and fairly complicated, and white eventually went on to win it. But I wanted to show you that bishop b5 idea because some of you might have been wondering, well, what am I going to do against white against this against this system? Okay, back to the chat for a second. Um, in the Queen's Gambit, I was meaning on 3a6, avoid certain typical lines as black. Well, you have to be more specific. You have to give me a line. 3a6 would be in the Slav, probably. Oh, 3a6 in the Queen's Gambit? Yeah, maybe I have seen that, actually. Well, you guys really keep up. There was some recent game with that, wasn't there? I, I'm very skeptical of playing a6 too early. You're saying play it, um, for example, even in this position right away. You might want to confirm that that's what you're saying. Oh, is this the Janowski? Like right now, this is the Janowski defense. I don't know. I just I like the white side of the queen's game, but anyway, I would I would just like seeing that move a6 in already. I just enjoy, I enjoy the when 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 white's um, when black's committed to a move like that. But that's just my personal prejudice. Yeah, I think someone played this recently, maybe. Um, what did Eliakin have to play against this, John? I think Eliakin had to play against the Janowski defense at some point. And of course, Eliakin played a6 on the seventh move against Capablanca in the in the traditional classical Queen's Gambit declined. Um, so what are we being asked here? You're saying that this is, should I play that for black? Uh, 
it was that the question chess philosopher I'm forgetting what your original question was how to play against it or should I play it or just what do I think of it because offhand I don't have much of an opinion I don't worry about moves like a6 that much because they're you know they're slow and I think I understand the Queen's Gambit enough to exploit a6 over the board so I don't worry about it too much okay we're seeing this more and more oh thank you you did actually say c4 e6 knight c3 and a6 thank you I missed that what unique lines can come from this waiting it's a waiting move for black it is kind of a waiting move isn't it uh, and it keeps open the idea that you might play d takes c4 also. Um, let me see. Yeah, so anything I say about it, it might not be keeping up with what people have been doing. Um, but uh, what would be my instincts about this? I guess... Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, I'll think about that, and I'll talk about that next week, because I don't want to say something and it just be completely wrong, because I know people are playing this a little bit recently. There have been some players that have been playing this as black, and they, that means that if they, if there's some good ideas behind it. I just have a feeling if you play the right order for white, you'll probably get a small positional advantage. I, I'm really, I'm not sure. I mean, is, this, is A6 that useful in this position? You know, I'm not, I'm not positive how great that is. It'd be interesting to see. Anyway, um, sorry, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm glad you asked it, and I and I think I know what you're saying. We've been seeing this a little bit recently. Um, let me just go down a little bit. What's a good game collection for someone who has USCF 1600 or 1700? To, I want to study master games. Yeah, I would say um, any of the, the great players. I tend to think some of the players are simpler to read. Their games collections are easier to read. Uh, Karpov's original games collection is wonderful a lot of words and not that many variations um, I always liked Anand's uh, best games just tremendous I'd get the you know the latest edition because it's got more pages and more <laughs> more games um, really instructive and fairly simple notes but very very good and you know you learn a lot about chess basically the recent Gelfand uh, books are excellent Gelfand's best games is great is a great series if you want to if you want something entertaining and fun and crazy uh, Shiroff's books are just wonderful his fire on the board books if you like tactical chess it sort of like it depends what you're after if you're just trying to learn almost any great players games are, are, are fine to read old or new um, but if you're you know if you're looking for particular types of styles then you might want to you know Tal's best games are, aren't quite as you know some of them are pretty positional actually but the one uh, Tal's book of his own games I think is just a wonderful book it's got a lot of prose and a lot of talking and a lot of fun commentary and great games I think it's one of the best books one of my favorite book, chess books actually are Tal's um, games his own game book I think it's from the old Everyman maybe before it was even Everyman and uh, you know like Cadogan or somebody or Pergamon or something um, there's a really good addition um, who else um, boy you can there's just a lot of good games collections out there find it find a strong player and, um, and and see what you think but but you might think about your what you're trying to do first are you trying to learn a lot of heavy technical things or are you trying to um, would you you want to have fun playing over the games and maybe maybe you want to be a more tactical player so get a more tactical player to study their games yeah what's your style that's a good question I've seen lots of games where black just suffers and suffers in the Brayer Lopez, like the recent Caruana game. Are there any main lines where black gets an aggressive position? Yeah, there was that Caruana game where he did well, but overall black's been getting pretty aggressive play out of the out of the Brayer. I think the black's doing pretty well in the Brayer, actually. That's interesting that you said that. In fact, I just had another game. Jim Tarzan, my friend, was playing in Chicago Open and was playing up by a few hundred points and, and got a great game as black in the Brayer. He also had Shiroff slaughtered in a... He had a huge attack as black in the Brayer against Shiroff, uh, Lexi Shiroff, and um, actually only lost because of, you know, blundering. Well, not blundering, but playing playing badly in the tactical phase. But he was winning, basically. He played a one of those old peace sacrifices in the Brayer. For the record, we should show what the Brayer is. Um, yeah, I always thought the Brayer was pretty aggressive, or latently aggressive. You know, that's how Spassky played it. You know, all those... There's all those places where you sacrifice a piece for two pawns, and that's still true in Brayer theory, that, that white often allows black to sacrifice a piece for two pawns, and it gets very exciting. Okay, so Brayer theory. So um, so we're talking about something like, um, I don't know if it matters the order here or something, but we, we, um, we get the Brayer is where you play back like this, and then when white plays here, you play here. 
And a lot of times black sets up with c6. The, the reason game Jim had just, you know, yesterday, I think this game was, was, was against c4. But, um, yeah, I'm surprised you say that because I think the Briar's in really good shape recently. A lot of very strong players. Some of the top players are playing the Briar. So I think there are ways. And, and one of the nice things about the Briar is that um, not only is it solid, but you do get a lot of counterattacking chances because what happens is you end up getting these positions where where, you're, where you get d5 in or you get knight takes. You get enough pressure that white has to do something. And when white plays d5, of course, you start breaking up the center. Um, either uh, you know, you're going to get a c6 move in and start breaking up the center that way, breaking down the center. So then you can get 2 to 1 in the center and you get aggressive play. I would say you get more aggressive play in the bri briar often, which is why Spassky played it than you do in some of the other lines of the Roy Lopez, some of the other slow lines. Um, I'll try and answer that specifically next week. I'll copy the chat and find it. But I've certainly seen a lot of aggressive main lines. J Jim Tarjan has been getting some real fun attacking games for black. No, I don't think he is just holding on at all. It may look like that, doesn't it? Because he's playing the slow knight b8 here. He's strong pointing that square. But but one of the ideas of strong pointing that square is that eventually you can break out and you haven't lost space. You actually have a chance to take the initiative later. At least that's the thought. Okay, life of time, yeah, life of games of Mikhail Tal I think is really, really good. No, I don't think it's too advanced, but, but you probably should be interested in a real dynamic style if you want to do that. I don't think Alyekin's best games probably would be the, all that appropriate because... Uh, they are very complicated notes, and, and um, they probably aren't all even that accurate because of the, you know, not it's pre-computer play and it's pre-modern play. And as as wonderful he is, one of the greatest players of history, he might, I I wouldn't think it would be really instructive. If you want an older player who would be instructive, it would be someone like Botvinnik, you know, his 100 selected games, the first the first volume, the second one's good too actually, but the first one's the best. Um, who else? John Thomas would probably have a recommendation uh, of games collections of older players. Some of the, the books, Andy Soltis' book on Lasker is just fantastic. Actually, Andy Soltis has written a couple good popular books of games collections. He did one on Fisher that was just terrific. Um, anyway, there's, there's many books, and we can talk about that. You can email me, and I'll answer you personally on that also. In the, you know, you guys can send me emails and I can, I, I'll try to answer questions personally or maybe throw them, you know, do that and also put them on the show. Um, what else we have here? Jim Rizzitano's Queen's Gambit declined. Okay. I guess that was in response to a question. Didn't think very much of what, John? What are we talking about? I've, I've lost the reference. So that the annotations from early in the last century didn't think... Oh, they didn't think much of A6? No. When I was growing up, A6 was considered just too slow or a mistake. Or I think partly because the famous games with it, of course, were won by White. I'm still not sure if I think that much of it, but I'm old-fashioned. It just, just seems too, too slow. But, you know, it's clearly if top players play it, it can't be that bad. Does that French version you just showed have a name? The French version I just showed. What did I show, folks? What did I show? I've already forgotten what I showed. Maybe you can tell me what the, the first moves were. Oh, oh, yeah. No, I, I just think of it as the Bronstein Petrosian variation or something. This is the Winnower. You probably know that. That's called the Winnower. And this is sort of the main line of the Winnower. And then, uh, of course, the main moves are 97, uh, C5, and um, what else? Anything else? Not really. And uh, so B6 and Queen D7, I think, are just, they don't have a particular name. But I think of them in terms of Bronstein and Petrosian because they're the ones that made them popular. Okay, hey, hi, Elliot Winslow is on. This is great. Um, so let me get back to things from last week because I'm doing a lot of stuff on the chat here and we haven't gotten that far yet. So that was the, the way to play against B6 and Queen D7, that uh, chandler Timon game. Um, okay, I got a question from John, actually, about uh, the initiative. Let me see. I think that's probably a good one to do next. Um, what does it mean to sacrifice a pawn or an exchange for the initiative? The problem is that there are two important terms here, pawn and initiative, and they exist in different intellectual realms. One is a material, something concrete, a pawn. Give me a pawn. Most of the time I should win the game, etc. 
At the same time, the initiative is some, somewhat evanescent. Nobody can really tell what it is and what it means. And that's true. You know, I looked up several books just to see if they would define the initiative. There's even a book on the initiative, which is very good. Ivan Sokolov wrote a book called Sacrifice and Initiative in Chess, which I've been looking at. In fact, at my first example, I'm going to show you a game that he shows, but he never gets around to defining the initiative. Uh, it's pretty tough to do. I, I was thinking from a common sense, sort of practical point of view, the initiative usually means, getting the initiative means um, being able to f make threats, whether they're positional or, or tactical, continuously make threats and put your opponent on his back feet so he isn't able to make threats at the same time. So he has to respond to those threats. So you're always making moves that force your opponent to respond or play defensively. Uh, whether it's that you're about to win a file and he has to defend against that, and then the next move you're threatening a piece and he has to defend against that, and the next move you're threatening to attack the king and he has to respond to that. The idea is you just keep making moves that keep him on in a defensive mode. And that doesn't mean you necessarily stand better. You may stand better, but you may also just be putting pressure on your opponent and trying to maintain that kind of pressure because it's, it's hard to play against threats. It's hard to play defensively. So that's just sort of a common sense view of what the initiative is. Uh, because I noticed when I was looking at all the examples of the initiative, they cover such a wide variety of things that you're doing. But I think that you could generalize that they mean, they, they involve not just attacking, but some kind of posing some sort of threat. Uh, whether, and as I say, it can be just a positional threat to win some sort of outpost or to take over a bunch of squares that your opponent has to respond to. And then the, your opponent responds to that, and then you have some other threat. You, you, you make some other uh, move that forces them to continue. And even if you're threatening to do something in two moves, that's okay. Like, like some, some two or three move plan, that as long as your opponent has to immediately respond to it and figure out what to do about it, it basically you've got the initiative. And Sokolov has these things where both sides get the initiative, where they're, you know, counter initiative, counter initiative. And I don't think that's really a legitimate use of the term, really. He has games where one side tries, you know, plays a, an aggressive move and has a threat, and the other side ignores the threat and plays a counterattack. And, and that would be called, uh, gra you know, grabbing the initiative or something. But, and, and they go back and forth for a few moves. But I think the word initiative becomes a little bit meaningless in that, in that context. It's, it's more... It's a more, it's a solider concept if you consider it with one person uh, doing, taking the initiative. So anyway, one of his examples was, um, I just went and looked up the game. Um, so let me put it up there. One of his examples, because it had to do with pawn sacrifices, because what John was talking about in his question was about sacrificing a pawn for initiative or an exchange for initiative. And I think pawn sacrifices are a very interesting question. He spends a lot of time talking about sacrificing a pawn to get the initiative. Okay, now I'm just going to zoom through these moves. You don't have to pay attention to them. They're, they're not only standard moves, but they're also um, relatively harmless. They're just developing and trying to attack, and the, the game's just going back and forth. They aren't relevant to our theme here. Um, okay, so white has the two bishops. Black has two, an extra center pawn and pretty good development. So it looks like a fairly harmless position. And in fact, this move looks a little odd, I think, because um, it looks like it's going to allow Black to sort of just solidify. And uh, Black takes a very natural move. And then White plays this move, sacrificing a pawn for what Sokolov calls the initiative. And it kind of is an initiative, because, because once Black takes that pawn, White continually has threats. So interestingly, in the game, he didn't take the pawn, and it provides a very good example of the initiative. Uh, so we'll see that next. But first, I'll just mention real quickly, if he does take the pawn, the idea is that White now has uh, he has an immediate threat on e6, which if he had taken right away, would have maybe uh, he would have had to retreat too quickly. So, so, but now he is thinking about taking there. And he's got the open file, and these bishops are aiming at the king. So he's got a nice little attack here in return for his pawn. And so the main, one of the main lines would be here, defending the pawn, here, just building up his attack, this move, and then this very pretty move, which, which keeps the initiative going because it threatens to play moves like rook g3 or maybe even bishop takes g7. Queen e4 is a big move. And, um, and so the best answer turns out to be here. And here's, it is a case of the initiative. Here's, here's an attack on h7. Okay, g6. Rook here, an attack. You make an attack every move. So he can't, Black can't get a counterattack going. He can't do, he can't do anything he wants to do. He has to always respond to your threats. That means that White has the, what, what we call the initiative. 
And then these, these are probably the best defensive moves for black. And then white plays a very clever computer-like move. This is his analysis, but I think it's true. This is a great move. And then, and, and now there's an idea that you might be taking and playing bishop a4 if the knight recaptures. So one of the, it's, that's, one of the, that's sort of a logical defensive move, even though it doesn't look that great. Uh, and then white piles up this way. Here's another threat on that bishop. And the bishop retreats. And now white plays, is that right? Does bishop retreat? Excuse me. No, I'm sorry, the bishop doesn't retreat. The knight comes back here. And white plays here again, another threat, four pieces on that bishop. And finally, the bishop takes here, and white plays rook f7, I think, right? Yeah, rook f7 here, and now you have this nice check. Every move is a threat, is the idea. And now if bishop takes, you get mated with queen check, queen takes. It's a cute little it's a cute little idea, but you can see what he means by initiative. He means you, you just keep, you're the one in control of the play. You don't give Black time to get off his back foot. So, so I guess to finish that off, it would be um, check. He would move over, and now you go up here, threatening various mates, like that, and the game's over into a couple moves. So, so in the game, he actually didn't take this pawn, but White got the initiative anyway. And let me show you what I mean by initiative. Starting now, it's almost like almost every move is almost a threat or or close to a threat. He threatens e6. Um, now he's threatening to destroy the king side. It's maybe not that direct a threat, but after this move, now he's threatening the queen. Okay, so he retreats. Now he threatens the bishop on d6 and gets a new piece into play. If you can develop pieces with attack, that, that usually means you have some kind of initiative. Um, so black moves, and white finally takes back, and now the threat is either rook takes f6 or bishop takes f6 winning here. So there's a constant threat. So black play attacks the knight, but white attacks again, doesn't pay attention to the he, he counterattacks, and this move is an incredible threat now, so pretty much the knight has to move. And then the bishop comes back, and guess what? Now you have a threat of this, which he has to react to, which is going to lead to mate. And um, so black, I don't know how that reacts to that properly, but it, that's, he makes that move, and white forks these pieces, and he's really thinking about playing knight f7 check, which is, in fact, I think what happens here. Right, and now bishop takes check, and well, anyway, every move was a threat. And the, he, the guy resigned because the only thing he can do is go back here and then white plays here and there's nothing to do about queen h7. So that's an example of the initiative. Black was on his back foot. He never had a chance to make his own kind of move or his own kind of threats. He's always defending. So I think that's that's good, a good example. And I have a couple of, of other initiative games, but I want to make sure we get to some other questions. But I want to show the other games that, that because John sent a game that involved a pawn sacrifice for the initiative, a positional pawn sacrifice, and there's some really good examples of that that I found that I think would be interesting to look at. But in the meantime, back to the chat. I guess the chat takes priority for a while. These days in the three knights c3 chess, you have to look at Neji's material. That's absolutely true. Fortunately, I've improved on some of Neji's material, but uh, <laughs> personally. But um, yeah, it's great stuff. It's an excellent. If you wanted a repertoire, it's white against knight c3. But you have, you, but you know, Elliot, you probably most of the player, most of the people listening to the show would end up probably playing something less forcing. Neji recommends all main lines. And a lot of it has to be memorized, right, Elliot? Because it's very sharp. And, and it includes, you know, getting all the way to force mate or something. But uh, was that a response to a question? OK, but anyway, that's absolutely right. Uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the best thing anybody's written about the white side of the winnower for a long time. Or the white side of the classical, also. Uh, a lot of great stuff in Knight C3. Even in the. Um, even in the slow lines, he does some great stuff. But fortunately for the French, uh, since I write the chess publishing column, I know that you can improve on his lines. Almost always, you can do something better than what he gives for black. But you really have to know your stuff. You have to know what you're doing. Uh, so so Neji does um, a full repertoire with this move in his books. And it's a fairly recent books, and they're really well analyzed. This is Parma, what's his name? Parma Jaron Neji. Neji. And uh, it's a quality chess book called what? What is it called? Grandmaster Repertoire. It's one part of the Grandmaster Repertoire series. Highly recommended, especially if you're white. I think that's that's a really good point. Um, what else do we have? Uh, one quibble I have with Tal's book is some of his best games aren't in it. Yeah, sure, but that's that's fine. I mean, you can always go to a database and look at other games or, or other books. 
Um, yeah, the Anand is terrific. Um, okay. Harmless. Expect a lot of candor. Of course, I didn't see any of this during the game. Uh, versus attack and defense. That's that's what, Elliot. Maybe a little say something else there. Um, I see 90% of the computer moves in my analysis during the games. Well, that's not bad. I probably see about 20%. <laughs> Are you sure, Alan? <laughs> it's not bad. Oh, you mean the first move? Yeah, I think I think most of us at least are able to see the first move the computer recommends, but um, whether whether we see the best move is not always always clear. Well, whether we choose that move, uh, just seeing it may not be good enough because you're seeing a lot of other moves too. Seems that both Briar and Briar are design brands, and Briar only goes for chess design. There you go. I really don't understand why my opponents see 100%. Well, they don't, do they? Unless they're cheating. Um, there we go. Okay, let's keep moving with the the stuff that I've been sent, other questions. I'd like to do some of the, oh, some of the things uh, that uh, Sokolov said, by the way. I've got some more examples uh, from that I found myself of, of initiative, but here's some of his comments he made that aren't really apropos of defining initiative, but are kind of interesting. He said, Mikhail Tal sacrifices have a reputation. There was a significant amount of bluff involved. And before I started working on this book and had a serious look at his sacrifices, I was inclined to concur with this general opinion. But nothing could be further from the truth. Even if you give them enough time to run, computer engines are not able to refute 90% of tall sacrifices. I think that's probably true. There's a lot of drawish lines, unfortunately. Um, he says there's always compensation even against the very best defense, and most of the time it's it's enough for at least a draw. Maybe that's the only only thing that would be yeah, that, that, that maybe we didn't know before about tall sacrifices, that a lot of times, as in so much of so many lines that, that the computer finds, there are ways to kind of whiz, you know, weasel out and get some sort of perpetual check a lot of times. But I absolutely agree. He was not as speculative as people like to think. Um, a lot of these ideas he, is he would intentionally play an unsound sacrifice. I don't think he did that very often, just for practical, uh, for practical purposes. He may have done that occasionally if it was complicated enough, but I think he mostly played things that he thought he could, yeah, at least draw and uh, maintain a serious sound attack in. Um, what else now? Tal, Tal was an attacking devil, a nine-headed monster, a true Houdini. Not that crap. Use that word in the book. Uh, we buy for eight euros and eighty euros and install in our computers. That not that kind of Houdini. He was the real deal. Okay, David Bronstein had many original ideas, but in genuine attacking play, attacking geniuses like Tal and Spassky were ahead and probably also ahead and probably also shoulders above him. I think that's true. I don't think Bronstein was a great attacker. There are a couple famous attacking games that have given him given that uh, impression, but I think his originality was more positional most of the time, or defense. It, it was it was non non critical. Um, Okay, there are other things that I found when I, when I was doing my work on this book. Uh, the involvement of computer engines has killed part of Kasparov's attack in genius. I'm not so sure what that means. I guess he means some of the, the attacks weren't sound. Spassky was a brilliant attacker, and almost every chess player is well advised to study his games. I guess I can buy that. Uh, from the modern elite, the player who is most inclined to take off on a slippery road of an intuitive sacrifice is probably Aronian. And um, that may also be true. I, I can believe that. I think he's. I think Aronian's one of the most creative and interesting players we've seen in ages. Uh, just, just fantastically interesting player, especially in sort of late middle game positions where nobody really knows what's going on. The pieces are just sort of floating everywhere. They aren't defined by games we've seen before. He'll come. He's he's incredibly strong, as is Carlson in those kinds of positions. Okay. Um, let me keep going here. I wanted to get to a question that I've been skipping for weeks and weeks. Okay, here we go. I've gotten a couple questions about the bishop e7 variation of the tarash. And one of them was about a main line, and maybe I'll get to that. But there's a lot of interest in these lines. And I think with good reason, a lot of the, uh, the repertoire books and DVDs recommend playing bishop e7. But he wants me to talk about this line, e5, c5. Queen g4, g5, which I think Moskalenko talks about a bunch too. Um, he says, "What do I think of that move?" I guess I guess I'd rather just play some of the more conventional stuff. I noticed recently people have played Bishop f8 and done okay, 
the, the most obvious move is this. In my book, I analyze both king f8 and g6. I think black's finding these lines. This is the one that's the most established and considered the best, and it's the reason e5 isn't played as often. In fact, e5 now is played, as I think I mentioned the other day, it's played more with the intention of playing bishop d3. For example, knight c6, bishop d3, and black can't take the pawn twice because of queen g4. Um, Lawrence Trent recommends this in his DVD, but it's also played more often than queen g4. Queen g4 has actually died out a little bit. Um, so you don't really need this move, g5, probably, if, if you don't want to play it. But it's certainly a cool move. The idea, of course, is to play h5 and just push all your pawns. And you're protecting your g-pawn at the same time. And then he gives this move queen h5. Let me put a, a game up. Uh, 302. Whoops. Yeah, I don't think g5 is necessary, but it's certainly a lot of fun, which I think is why he was asking it. Like, why not have some fun if your opponent's playing this way? Okay, so here's the game. And he plays this move g5. White plays queen h5, which I think is the only really challenging move. I've looked at all the other moves, and it really makes sense. h5 is a big threat for black. What black would like to do is not only play h5, but play knight h6 f5 afterwards and get more pressure on the center. And then any time a knight comes to f3, of course, you're going to have g4, you've got knight c6, you have queen b6, there's a lot of pressure on the center. So h5 really is a positional threat. So what white does here is a really good move. He plays this queen h5 move and just blocks the, uh, and for some reason my computer isn't making that move. Oh, because of c3, excuse me. So um, queen h5 is the move white makes, and I think that's the best move, and it's very natural. That's kind of an outpost, and there's no way of getting the queen out of there, so it makes a lot of sense. In this game, uh, white played... Let me just get, uh, see if I have any notes on this. Let me real quick check and see what I've got here. Oh, there's another of these initiative games. Give me one second. Okay. C takes D. So I think knight C6 is a better move than what black plays. Black plays this and it works out successfully, but I think you're better off playing knight C6 first because what it does is it stops this weird idea that black white has of playing f4 takes and then just moving a piece out to to that square because because it has a direct threat of knight takes d4 and so that's a little hard to describe and i have a lot of lines but i think because of the time we will i'll just show you this game and we'll finish with that uh in this game he played here and white played here and and Korchnoi thought this was a great strong novelty, but in fact, I'm not so sure it's even the best move. I think I think white should think about playing something like this. It's really an odd move, but then, and then play this. And and the idea is that he's going to play bishop d3, maybe even bishop d3 first, actually, because then maybe this knight can come up this way. But the point is this f file is very dangerous. It's like all the wrong things that can happen, the French have sort of happened here. You've, you've got to be really careful here. The, the e5 pawn's still there, and, and white has a really nice attack on the f file. That's what I rec I'd recommend for white to play here, But uh, since a lot of you are Tarash players. But instead it goes this way, and black plays knight c6. And, and because it's so late, I think I will just show you what I think he should have done in answer. Can The person who sent this suggests queen c7. I think he's 100% right. And the engine also likes this, too, because now whenever you take here, this queen takes check. So that's a much better timing, timed uh, move. And the main line of that, so actually, I, I should have, um, I should just show you what my main line is here. Uh, if white plays here, you can swing back with the queen defensively and win that pawn, and that comes out pretty nicely. It may only be about equal, but it's at least equal anyway. It's quite, it's, per, it's, it's, it's equal or slightly better. So the best move is bishop d3, probably, and then knight c6, bishop g5, and knight takes. So you got rid of his center. And usually when you got rid of the center, you're, you're able to be okay, even if, you, even if your piece play is a little bit shaky. The best line for white is probably this, attacking that knight twice, and knight takes, I believe, and then just knight takes here. And white has um, better development, and there's some weak squares around here. But black has the uh, masses of center, masses of pawns influencing the center, and white really only has one. So uh, black's center pawns make up for, and also black has bishop versus knight, and that ultimately, especially after e5, might might give um, might give white some problems. 
for example, in an end game or something. So I think this is roughly equal, and the computer thinks that too. And if you play out the games, they're fairly even. So, um, so the queen h5 moves very interesting, but I think white should, black should probably answer knight c6 first and not c takes d. But um, anyway, I just noticed it's gotten really, really late, so we ought to, we ought to come out. Okay, let's let's see what we're saying here. Uh, Tuesday night marathon. Good luck, El Elliot. Um, reminds me to SMS you regarding the relationship between dental problems and worse things. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Please do that. You can also um, email, yeah, email me, definitely. You don't even have to SMS me. Okay, Alan, I was beaten by a king move, which was 16 half moves in advance, and my opponent was 840 fide. It may have been a coincidence. He may have just been throwing things out there and didn't have any idea what he was doing, but happened to have, uh, it happened to be the best move, 16 half moves in advance. But, uh, or he's just cheating. There's always the just cheating uh, possibility. I know um, there's a fair amount of cheating online, but I think most of the games you play are going to be honest. Most of the people you play, I, if you think someone's doing that, I would just stop playing them. There's no reason. There's plenty of people to play. One of the initiative games that impressed me most was uh, Tal Kavalek. Um, I don't remember. Boy, that's a good tournament book. The Montreal 19. If anybody want to, wants to get a great tournament book, except it's probably out of print now. I mean, it's probably hard to get even. Everything's out of print, but it's hard to get. It's Montreal 1979 by Kavalek. And um, Tal won that tournament brilliantly, uh, tied with Karpov, I believe. Is that right, John? I think he tied with Karpov in that, and, and the book is just magnificent. Um, really fun, really good. The, it had that great balance of annotations, not incredibly dense. You know, this is pre-computer, uh, but at the same time, good enough to cover what mattered. So, all right, folks. Thanks, everybody. I guess it's gotten late without me even noticing, really late. And uh, please send me your, e your emails, askimwatson at chessclub.com. And that's really, I could really use more of those. I'm not getting as many as I was before. A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at chessclub.com. Re remember, ICC members, you can message me at John L. Watson. That's one word, J-O-H-N-L-W-A-T-S-O-N. Uh, or you can just figure out things for the chat in advance and spring them on me. You can stump the master, is what one of my students said. Play stump the master. Okay, thanks, everybody, and I will see you next week.